Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core, and this here is the Amazon Fire TV Stick. You've probably seen one of these before. And this thing is made for streaming, so you can plug it into the back of your TV and then play your Netflix and things like that. And they have a bunch of different models on their website, but we're gonna focus on the high-end one, which is called the 4K Max. This one retails for about $60, but it's always on sale. As you can see right here, it's $40 right now. And I think that's a pretty decent deal for what you get. It supports 4K and HDR and Dolby Vision Atmos, as well as Wi-Fi 6E. And so just on its own, I think it is a pretty good buy. But what you may not realize is the Amazon Fire TV Stick is a pretty capable emulation device as well. With just a couple configurations, we can BAM, turn it into a Game Boy. Or if you want to play BAM, NES, you can totally do that. Or let's say you're a fan of the 16-bit era like BAM, the Super Nintendo, or BAM, the Sega Genesis, all those are playable here. On top of that, BAM, you can turn it into a full arcade machine playing all your 80s and 90s classics, and BAM, even Neo Geo 2. In fact, it is surprisingly capable. It can play all the way up through Nintendo Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, and BAM, PSP as well. And it can even play BAM. Okay, not this one, but you get my point. Either way, what I'm gonna do in this video is show you how to set all of this stuff up. The greatest part about it is that it doesn't require any modification on the device at all, so you can still use it for all that streaming. But if you're in the mood to do something other than streaming video, you can then just grab a controller and start playing your favorite retro game. And there are a couple quirks in getting this all set up, so we'll walk you through that process here in this video, but I think you can probably get it done in an afternoon. And considering the fact that this is still a very capable TV stick, I consider all this retro gaming to be a bonus on top of it. And so rather than spending your money on something like a Raspberry Pi or an NES Classic, you can play retro games on a device that you may actually already own. So grab a snack and drink, and let's go ahead and get started. Okay, as we get started here, as always, I'm going to have a written guide that'll accompany this video. So all you have to do is go to my website, RetroGameCore.com, and you'll see a listing of all the guides, and there's a Fire Stick guide right here. And so if there's something you missed in the video, or maybe I'm talking a little bit too fast, you can always go back to the written guide and then follow it at your own pace. And you can find a link to this written guide in the video description below. Now to start, you're going to need an Amazon Fire TV Stick. Now I recommend getting the 4K Max, that's going to be the high-end one. This one's about six months old, and it'll probably get replaced at some point point, but as of right now, it has a quad-core CPU that's clocked at 2.0 gigahertz. Now, the Fire Stick itself is pretty small, and it only has one USB port. It's a micro USB, as you can see right here on the side. And it also comes with an HDMI extender if you're not able to plug this directly into your TV. It also comes with a power brick. It's one of those cheap USB-A ones, and then it also comes with a charging cable, which is going to have USB-A to micro USB. And then finally, it comes with its own remote control, complete with a set of Amazon Basics AAA batteries. Now, in addition to the Fire stick itself, there are a couple accessories you're going to need to get set up. The first one's going to be a wireless controller. I would recommend this one from 8 Do. It's called the SN30 Pro. This one is a Super Nintendo style controller, but has a full gamut of buttons that are going to work with all the systems we're going to emulate here today. This one will usually go for about $40 or $45 on Amazon, but it's recently been refreshed. They now have Hall Sensor analog sticks for them. This means they'll be a lot less likely to develop stick drift over time. And there are a couple of other color options available too. There's a transparent green one, which looks pretty cool, as well as transparent purple. Anyway, I'll have links to all this stuff down in the video description below, as well as in my written guide. Now, in addition to a controller, we need a means to get our games onto the device as well. And for this, we need two different tools. The first is going to be a USB flash drive. Now, this one's a little bit tricky because you need to use an older USB 2.0 flash drive, not one of those fancy 3.0 ones. So the ones that I recommend are from SanDisk. They're called the Cruiser Blade. Again, these are relatively old and kind of have slow transfer speeds, but all the same, you want something that's old. And that's because these older drives have a lower power draw. And because we're only going be using one cable to connect both the drive and the Fire TV stick, we want something that's not going to take a lot of juice. And thankfully, these are super cheap as well. It's about $8 for a 64 gigabyte model, but you can splurge and get a $10 128 gigabyte one too. It's really going to depend on how many games you want to put on your flash drive and whether or not you're going to be playing CD-based games like PS1 and Dreamcast, PSP, stuff like that. Personally, I think it's probably just best to get the larger one, and that way you have plenty of space if you want to add more later. Anyway, other than the USB drive, we need to way to connect it to the Fire TV. If you remember, it only has one USB plug on the side of it. And so that's when our final accessory comes in. This thing is a USB port adapter. And these are super cheap as well. I think they're like six or seven dollars, but they're just a USB splitter. So really simple. So what we'll do here is we'll plug the USB drive into the USB A port, and then we'll plug the micro USB port side into the Fire Stick. From there, we'll connect the power plug to that final adapter, and we are then good to go. And then this way, we will supply power to both the flash drive as well as the 
the Fire TV and allow them to communicate with one another. And really that's about it when it comes to setup. So let's go ahead and plug in our Fire TV stick and actually go through the setup process of getting this up and running. Now for the purposes of this video, I actually bought a brand new Fire TV stick so you can see the setup process. And I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but essentially you need to sign into your Amazon account to get started. From there, we'll navigate over to the right till we get to the app section. It's gonna be to the very left of the settings button. Once you're there, scroll down until you get to the app library section. Once you're there, go into the search bar and then search for the word downloader. This is a very popular app, so if you even just press the letter D, it'll probably show up as the first choice. Anyway, once you find it, go ahead and download and install it. It'll all be totally free. And then once you have it installed, we need to give it special permissions to allow us to install other apps onto our device. We're gonna go into the settings menu and then scroll down until you find My Fire TV. And the first option will say about, go ahead and click on that. And then it's gonna give you the name of your device. From here, you wanna click on the name of your device about six or seven times. It'll actually give you a prompt and say that you're a couple steps away from becoming a developer. Anyway, once you've tapped on it enough, it's gonna say that you're a developer, you're good to go. And so we'll back out to the main Fire TV options. And now within these settings, you'll see a choice that says developer options. So click on that and then go into the install unknown apps. From there, you should see the downloader app. So go ahead and click on that and switch it from off to on. If this doesn't show up, you may have to start up the app one time to get it to appear. Anyway, that's all the prep work we need to do for the downloader app. The next thing I wanna do is connect my Bluetooth controller. It's gonna make navigating through these menus a lot easier. So back in the main settings page, there's a section that says controllers and Bluetooth devices. And this is pretty self-explanatory, but you'll go down to the game controller section, and then you're gonna put your controller into pairing mode. It should then see it, and then you can connect to it. And that's it, we are now good to go. Next, we're gonna go back into the app section and go into our downloader app. It might ask for some permissions, just go ahead and click, yeah, man, I wanna do it. And then once you've gone through that, you're gonna see a search bar. And here you wanna type in the name of my channel, which is gonna be Retro Game Core. And once you have it typed in, go ahead and click that go button, and then it'll show you some search results. From there, find the one that just goes to Retro Game Core. That's gonna go directly to my website. From here on the front page, there will be a link to my Fire Stick guide. So you're gonna navigate down and then find that. And it is gonna be a little bit weird to move around the cursor with the D-pad, but you will definitely figure it out. Anyway, once you're in in my Fire Stick guide, go into the table of contents, and there you're gonna find a link that says download emulator apps. Go ahead and click on that. From there, scroll down until you find a gray box with a listing of different emulators. And these are gonna be direct links to the emulators that I tested and found to be the best possible ones for the Amazon Fire TV Stick. Just bear in mind that as I get more feedback from the community, I might add more emulators, so it might be more than four by the time you're actually watching this video. Anyway, to get these installed is super easy. We're just gonna click on the first one here, which is RetroArc. From there, it's gonna start the download process. This one might take a minute because it is a larger file. And then after that, it's gonna ask you if you wanna install it. Go ahead and click on that. And once that's done, it's gonna let you know. So let's jump right into RetroArc and do a couple quick configurations just because this one is gonna be the main emulator we're gonna be using. First thing, make sure you give it access to your external storage and then give it a minute to extract the base app. You're gonna see the font change to something a little bit easier on the eyes. And once that happens, we are now good to start getting configured. Now we're not gonna run through the entire RetroArc setup process in this video because I have a full setup guide for that. And so rather than extend this video by like another 20 minutes to show you all the ins and outs of that app, I'm just gonna point you to that other video if you don't know how to use RetroArc. But if you've never heard of this app or tried it before, don't worry, I'm gonna show you a couple of the basics really quickly. The first thing we wanna do is go into the online updater section. From there, click on the core downloader and then you'll see a list of all the emulators that are contained within RetroArc. And this is essentially where you wanna do a bunch of your emulator shopping. You're gonna go through here, find the systems you wanna play, and then download those cores. And if you've already used RetroArc before, this is gonna be very familiar because it's all gonna be the same thing. And there are a ton of different cores here, including some very obscure systems. But that being said, here are the cores that I recommend for the Fire Stick 4K Max. And I'm really just focusing on the major systems, so things like Arcade, Nintendo, Sega, and Sony. If you wanna try something else like Commodore 64 or something along those lines, you can definitely do that as well. Anyway, that's the very first thing you want to do when first starting up RetroArc. We'll talk more about this app later in the video. Before we move on, I would recommend going back to that downloader app and going to my guide. And if you do want to play these specific systems like Dreamcast, PlayStation Portable, and Nintendo DS, I also recommend downloading these standalone emulators. And the process is going to be exactly the same as we saw with RetroArc. You'll click on it, it'll download, then you install it. Now, once we've got those apps installed, I think it's a good time to pause and actually add our games to the USB drive. 
And if the drive that you're using is over 64 gigabytes, then you're going to have to format it for the Fire TV. It's going to require a FAT32 format. Thankfully, this is super easy. All you have to do is just plug the USB drive directly into that Fire TV using that splitter. And once you have it plugged in, you will probably get a prompt like this. It says it can't read the USB drive, and so it needs to be reformatted. It'll give you two options, external storage and device storage. And I recommend you use the external storage option. That means you can pull out the USB drive and then put it in your PC and then load the game on that way. It's going to be a lot faster and more convenient. Anyway, once you've chosen that, it's going to format the drive and then you're going to be good to go. So let's eject the SD card. You're going to find that in the My Fire TV settings under USB drive. And once you've ejected it, you can now throw it into your PC. It doesn't matter if it's Windows or Mac or Linux, they're all going to work. Now, when you open up the drive, you're going to see a bunch of folders. What we want to do here is add an additional folder and we're going to call it games. And it really doesn't matter what you name it. You can call it ROMs or games or whatever you would like. Now within that, you're going to make all of your subfolders. This is where you're going to put your BIOS files as well as your games. And all these files are going to be copyrighted, so I'm not going to show you where to get them. You're on your own to find your own ROMs and BIOS files. Now in addition to those game files, I also mentioned BIOS files. These are going to be system files that are necessary for certain emulators to work properly. And like with game files, these are copyrighted, so I'm not going to show you where to get them, but at the very least, I can show you the names of them. And so here's a listing of the common BIOS files that you'll need to use in order to run certain systems on RetroArch. But there are a couple things of note. For example, with Game Boy and Game Boy Color, these BIOS files are not required, they're optional. But if you add them, it's gonna give you that nice Game Boy and Game Boy Color boot screen from back in the day. For PlayStation 1, there are many different BIOS files. So the ones I have listed here is just one of many examples. And then finally, with the Neo Geo BIOS, you wanna put it both in the BIOS folder as well as in your Neo Geo folder where all your other games are. But that's really about it when it comes to the necessary BIOS files to get up and running, and I'll have all this listed in the written guide as well. Anyway, once you've moved your game files into the appropriate folder, we're ready to move on to the next step, which is to actually play these games using your emulators. So we're going to connect our flash drive back to the Fire Stick, and then we're going to open up RetroArch to get started. And just as a reminder, you know, I have a full starter guide for this, and that'll be linked down below, so we're not going to go through everything. But here are some of the configurations that I recommend setting up to help you get started. First, I like to change the look and feel of the app by changing changing out the menu driver. This is why it looks like a PS3 right now. You can find this by going into settings and then user interface and then menu. And here you just want to change it to XMB, which is cross media bar. After that, when you close out a RetroArch and start it back up, it's going to look like this. Now also in the settings, you want to go into input and then RetroPad binds and port one controls. Here I recommend going through each of the controls and remapping them to your controller. And this will ensure that every game plays correctly. After that, still within the input section, I would recommend going into the hotkey section. This is where you set up the shortcuts to help you kind of enhance your gameplay experience. Now, all this stuff is covered in that other RetroArch video, but I did also make a graphic for you here. And these are the hotkeys that I recommend for RetroArch when using it with a Fire Stick. The most important one is going to be the hotkey enable button. I recommend setting this to select. After that, all the other buttons that you configure are going to require you to press select first. So for example, if you want to close down the game, you would press select and start because close content is associated with the start button. Or for example, if you want to save your state, you would press select and R1. Anyway, just go through the menu and set those up how you would like, and those are my recommendations. After that, the other configuration that I think is absolutely necessary is going to be found within the directory settings. Here we need to set our system or BIOS folder. After you select this, then you want to click on that parent directory button a few times until you get to the root directory of the storage. And you'll know you're in the right spot when you can see the word storage slash and then a bunch of numbers and letters. And that's going to be your flash drive. So click on that and then navigate down to the games folder or whatever you named it when you first set it up. Then choose your BIOS folder and select use this directory. And that's it, it's now going to know where your BIOS files are located. After that, I would recommend going back to the main menu, then scroll down to configuration files, save current configuration. That's going to save all those settings for the next time that you open up the app. Finally, the other thing I would recommend setting up within RetroArch is going to be playlists. This is going to make it a lot easier to find all of your games. This you can find under the import content setting and you'll want to go down to the section that says manual scan. And I'll show you an example right here on how to get this set up. Under content directory, you're going to choose whatever folder you want to play your games from. We'll use Game Boy as our example, so I'll go into Game Boy and then scan this directory. Next, under system name, we want to find Nintendo and then Game Boy. This is basically letting RetroArch know that that folder that we just chose is going to contain Game Boy games. After that, we need to set the default core, and for this, we're going to choose our Game Boy core, which is called Gambate. Again, this is telling RetroArch to launch those Game Boy games that we found in that folder with this specific emulator. After you've set up those three things, we're good to go, so we 
we can go and select start scan. And that's it. You just need to do that for every one of your systems. And then after that, on the right, you will now see all of these listed as a playlist. And for the most part, this is how you're going to launch your games. You're going to navigate through them, then choose them, and they'll start right up. And the nice thing is, is it'll start to download the box art for each of these games as you scroll through them. So it's going to look really nice over time. Now, one thing a lot of people like to do is set up a front end launcher. It gives you a more cohesive experience as you're navigating through your games. But unfortunately, a lot of these launchers do not work with the Amazon Fire Stick for one reason or another. For example, this is Daijisho, one of my favorite launchers. And I spent quite some time setting this all up and scanning all my games and everything seemed fine. However, when it comes to actually launching a game through RetroArch, it's not so easy. It actually shows an error code and doesn't launch. Launch. And I tried a bunch of searches on the internet and everyone else is having the same issue. So unfortunately, a lot of these launchers are not going to work. However, it will work with standalone emulators. So if you still want to use Daijisho, it is a possible option, just not with RetroArch. Anyway, that's the essential of getting started with RetroArch and the other emulator is going to be very similar as well. So now I want to move into the gameplay section where I'm going to test all my favorite systems and see exactly how well they play on the Fire Stick. And we'll start with the very basic systems and work our way up to see just how far things can go. Now, starting with handheld systems, it's going to be no problem whatsoever. So you'll be able to play Game Boy and Game Boy Color. All of these will play just fine. You can also set things like shaders and filters in order to enhance the visual experience while you're playing these games as well. And it's going to be a similar story with Game Boy Advance. So if you're looking to play basically any of the Game Boy systems, they're all going to run without a hitch here on the Amazon Fire TV stick. Moving into home console systems, these all are going to play great as well. We'll start with NES. And Basically, every game that I tried here played perfectly fine. And it's going to be a similar story with all these 16-bit systems as well. Things like Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, all of these are going to play perfectly too. And because we have so much headroom here, you can also apply things like shaders and filters, and most of them will play just great. In fact, I found this to be probably the sweet spot when it came to playing emulation on the Amazon Fire TV Stick was the 8-bit and 16-bit era. I think some of that had to do with the SN30 Pro controller that I was using just because it felt very Super Nintendo to use it. But then also it's a pretty neat novelty to be able to play these systems on a streaming stick. After all, these are the games I grew up playing and so it's just kind of cool. Now beyond just home console systems, you can also play arcade games, and most of your 80s and 90s classics will play just fine. Again, this is a great fit for the SN30 Pro because it has that analog stick on the bottom, and so you can use that while playing these arcade games. And in addition to your typical beat-em-ups and shooters, you can also play Neo Geo games. These all play perfectly fine. But just bear in mind that not every single game is going to play at full speed. For example, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker had quite a bit of slowdown here and there. I would say it's still mostly playable, but all the same, it's not a perfect experience. And once you get to those high-end arcade games, things like Tekken and Killer Instinct, unfortunately these ones are not going to play at all. So basically everything through the 80s and maybe the mid-90s will be okay, with some exceptions like these. Moving on to the 3D-based systems, we'll start with PlayStation 1. I'm using the Swan Station Core right here, and I found that every game that I tried played perfectly fine at a native or 1x resolution. I found that if I doubled the resolution, that a lot of games would have slowdown, and so I kept everything at the native resolution. But yes, every single game that I tried including the really hard ones like Bloody Roar 2, played perfectly fine. Now, Nintendo 64 was a different beast. This one has three different emulator cores within RetroArch, and I found that one that worked the best for the most part was the Parallel Core. And by default, this one's going to play at a 480p resolution, and I found that most games actually played really well just in these default settings. And so I think the majority of your 3D-based games, things like Super Mario 64, Diddy Kong Racing, even Ocarina of Time, all these played fine. And probably the upper tier when it comes to playing these games at 480p was Banjo-Kazooie. And usually when this game plays fine, that means that about three quarters of Nintendo 64 games are also going to play well. But just bear in mind, that doesn't mean that every game is going to play at full speed. Cruising USA is also a test game that I like to try. And here I found that at 480p, it definitely wasn't playing at full speed. So instead, what you can do here is go into the core options and then change the resolution down to 240p instead. After that, go into the manage core options and then save game options. That means that only Cruise in USA is going to be saved at a 240p resolution. Now to get this to work, you have to close out a RetroArch and then start it back up. But then after I did that, I found that yeah, at a 240p resolution, Cruise in USA was a lot closer to full speed. I was still getting some slowdowns here and there, but I personally would consider this to be playable. It is going to make the graphics more chunky looking, but it's still pretty awesome to be able to play this high-end game on an Amazon Fire Stick. 
However, even with that 240p resolution, I did find that some games still didn't play at full speed, including GoldenEye 007 and Conker's Bad Fur Day. So when it comes to Nintendo 64, I would say that most games play just fine at a 480p resolution, some games will have to be knocked down to a 240p resolution to play at full speed, and even then there will be a couple games here and there that aren't going to play fully. But at least as far as I'm concerned, I would say that Nintendo 64 is mostly playable on this device. Next, let's talk about Sega Dreamcast. Now, the RetroArch core would crash, so it didn't start at all, so I did have to try other standalone emulators. I started with the Redream emulator, and things were looking pretty good. There were a couple games that played just fine, like Jet Set Radio. However, other games played at full speed, but had a lot of graphical issues, including Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and Soul Calibur 2, as well as Crazy Taxi 2. Each of these games had so much graphical distortion going on with the layers that I decided that this really wasn't worth it. So instead, I moved over to the Flycast emulator. Again, this one is a standalone emulator, and this is the one I recommend for Dreamcast. There's a couple great things about this one. Number one, if you go into the video settings, you can turn on widescreen cheats, and there are a lot of Dreamcast games that'll play at a full 16x9. On top of that, many of these games won't play at full speed unless you use a frame skip, and luckily, Flycast has that as an option. So I would recommend turning on frame skip so that most of these games will be playable. It's not going to be a perfect 60 frames per second experience, but still, I think it's a pretty good one overall. However, just bear in mind that there were a few games that I tried that I couldn't get playing at full speed. For example, Sega Rally 2 and NBA 2K2 both did not play at full speed. It almost felt like the frame skip just wasn't working. So again, it's a lot like Nintendo 64, where the majority of games are going to play just fine, with a couple settings tweaks here and there, but there will still be a few that aren't going to play at full speed. Moving on, let's try out a couple more systems. We'll start with Sega Saturn. Now, unfortunately, this one I found to not be playable at all. Both the standalone emulator as well as the Yabus Hanshiro core, which is usually more performance-minded, played nowhere close to full speed. In fact, the best I could get was about half speed for most of these games, so unfortunately, if you want to play Sega Saturn, this is not the device to get. Another system that struggled within RetroArch was Nintendo DS. This emulator is not really set up for two-screen gaming, and so as a result, it requires a lot of hardware that the Amazon Fire Stick just doesn't have. But thankfully, you can sideload the Drastic emulator, and this one works fine. That being said, there are a couple quirks with this one, as well as the PSP emulator which we're about to get to. And that is that both of these apps are going to ask you to point to the directory where you have your game stored. And unfortunately, the file management app within the Amazon Fire Stick doesn't work with the controller or the Amazon remote. And this can be really frustrating because all you need to do is just click on a certain folder. And I found the only way to get this working was using a Bluetooth mouse. And even then, the mouse cursor won't show up in the file manager app. So instead, you just kind of have to blindly click until you can find the USB drive. It's going to take a few minutes, and I'm guaranteeing it's going to be pretty frustrating. But once you have selected the USB drive, you can then use a controller to go into your games folder and then choose the Nintendo DS folder. Same thing here, once you get into the DS folder, it's going to ask you to click the use this folder, and the controller again can't select it, so you'll have to go back and use the mouse. And just like with the other section, you can't see the mouse cursor, so it's going to be a little bit tricky. But once you finally manage to click on it, you're going to be good to go, and you won't have to do this again, it's going to remember that spot. And thankfully, Nintendo DS games play just just fine in the drastic emulator after you get through that wonky configuration. Of note, you can press down on the analog sticks L3 and R3 to swap out the different screen modes to find one that's going to match the game that you're playing. You can also use the right analog stick as a touch cursor if you need to touch something on the screen. Either way, yes, I would say Nintendo DS is perfectly playable once you get through that configuration. And finally, let's wrap up with the PlayStation Portable emulator. This is the last system that I would consider to be somewhat playable. For all these games, I'm going to play them at a native 1x resolution. And depending on the size of your TV, it's going to look pretty pixelated, and that's because it's supposed to be made for like a 4-inch screen. And so some games just may not look as good as the others because it's being blown up to such a large TV. Either way, from a performance standpoint, I found that most games played pretty well at a 1x resolution. I would get a couple pauses and stutters here and there, but I don't think it has to do with the emulation, but rather the file transfer speed of that USB drive. Either way, I was still pretty impressed that I would say the majority of games, maybe three quarters of them altogether, play just fine in a native resolution. To give you an idea of the upper limits, we'll talk about two different games. The first is going to be Outrun 2006. This one I consider to be in like the 90% category, where if this one plays, the 90% of games will play just fine. And this one is pretty good. It still does slow down here and there, but I personally would consider this to be playable. And if you wanted, you could also turn on frame skip to give you a bit of a more consistent experience. And then finally, the upper tier of PlayStation Portable I would consider to be games like God of War, and unfortunately even playing this at a 1x resolution with a frame skip on, it's not quite at full speed. 
So there's definitely an upper limit where some PlayStation Portable games aren't going to work fully, but it takes quite a while to actually get there. So like with Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast, I would consider this to be mostly playable. And really, that kind of wraps it up for this video. I wanted to show you how to get up and running when it comes to playing on a Fire Stick and then what kind of performance you can expect. And I think it's pretty impressive that we can play all these games on a device that was never meant to play emulation in the first place. And also let me know if you have any questions in the comments down below, and I'll also be updating my written guide as time marches on. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we'll see you next time. Happy gaming.